this uh, Dinesh Mohan Memorial Lecture, we are very honored to have Dr. Sumantran deliver the lecture. Uh, before I tell you more about Dr. Sumantran, I would actually like to invite our Deputy Director, Professor Ganguly, to welcome all of you and Dr. Sumantran and the two discussions we have today uh, for this event. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Professor Geetam, for inviting me to this uh, very special lecture uh, on the occasion of your meeting. And uh, Professor Dinesh Mohan was a very dear friend, and I'm very happy to be part of the program in his name. So on behalf of IIT Delhi, uh, and on behalf of Rangan Banerjee, the director, I invite you for this uh, lecture and the of a discussion which is following the lecture by two eminent panelists. The lecture is by, of course, Professor Sumantran, who was uh, the chairperson of the committee yeah, which reviewed yes, the right. trip center. And I had some discussions with him in that. So I'm glad he's giving this talk today, uh, which would be followed by the discussion and the panelists, I think, are Anil Kumar, Anil Kumar, and Vinay. Vinay, of course, I have been interacting with him at IIT Delhi for some time. So I hope you had a great day today, and uh, wonderful to have you all here, and hope that this center uh, does uh, uh, things for the country, we are expanding, and many, many aspects of uh, roads and highways, and there is a special thing to be also done by if the ministry wanted. I don't know whether we're going in that path. So thanks for calling me today, and I hope you have a great session. Thank you very much. So now, uh Dr. Sumantran is going to give her this lecture on transforming urban mobility for sustainability and safety. If you actually check your bags, the manuscript of the lecture is in your bag. And uh, let me just, many of us already know Dr. Sumantran, but a brief introduction. Dr. Sumantran is the chairman of Celeris Technology and a member of the board of directors for several organizations in the domains of automotive, electronics, and aviation. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me tell you that I'm honored to be a part of this symposium and this lecture for at least two important reasons. First, uh, uh, I found Dinesh Mohan Perhaps not surprisingly, our paths uh, go back together for many years, uh, starting actually in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and of course, through the years in my uh, involvement in the auto industry, and of course, Professor Dinesh uh, you know, pivotal role at IIT Delhi, we had many, many interactions. And notwithstanding the fact that we straddled the boundary between academia and industry, uh, we did not let those differences come in the way of our friendship. I have the greatest respect for his commitment and his passion for road safety. And uh, it is uh, for me an honor to deliver the first uh, Dinesh Mohan Memorial Lecture. Of course, the second reason I'm honored to be here is the role that I believe IIT Delhi and the Truth Center can play uh, as I know you have been discussing all day, and as I will briefly touch upon in my lecture, uh, mobility across the world, particularly in emerging economies and definitely in India, requires a lot of attention from the point of view of safety. And uh, I know during the charter that was being developed for the Trip Center in Delhi, in IIT Delhi, uh, we very quickly concluded that this center needs to be very strongly supported by IIT Delhi and the government of India and deserves to be several times larger than what it is, merely for the fact that it addresses a very, very important function for society in India. So I'm honored to be here 
for that reason as well. And uh, once again, Deepam, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, event. If I now uh, switch over to my lecture, which I hope will come across here. Okay. Um, you know, the topic I'd like to speak about today is uh, transforming urban mobility for a combination of sustainability and safety. Uh, a lot of this is the result of uh, a book that I had co-written with two colleague professors from MIT in Boston. And we spent about three, four years uh, doing research for the content of the book. And it led us to some very important uh, questions and hopefully led us to some potential ways to go forward. To start with, um, you know, uh, Einstein is uh, reported to remark that nothing changes until something moves. For all of us engaged in transportation and mobility, this is encouraging words. Uh, and if we allow ourselves the freedom to take this statement beyond physics to society and economics, we all understand why mobility is so crucial in modern society. From the earliest civilizations that typically happened on in river valleys and in seaports, one could already sense that as society developed and evolved, mobility of goods and people was extremely important. And so all of us in the transportation uh, field play a very important role in sustaining this urge and this hunger for mobility uh, across uh, all society. But of course, the context of mobility, how it needs to be serving society, the, the demands that are placed on uh, any mobility system have evolved with time. Uh, most importantly, one cannot discuss uh, a desired mobility system or a solution without uh, comprehending the context in which uh, it is required to serve people. Uh, we have, over the last 150 years, uh, seen a massive trend towards urbanization. And uh, this is perhaps understandable because, you know, why does a young youth in rural India want to aspire to be in Bangalore? Or why does somebody in rural South in the US want to be in Los Angeles or New York? Uh, this uh, agglomeration in, in critical urban centers offers any individual huge multiplication in opportunities for economics and social uh, contact. So through ages, at least through the last 150 years, there has been a very discernible pattern of urbanization. And in fact, uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, median income growth is highly correlated with increases in population density. And it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Urbanization further breeds densification. Uh, most of us are familiar with the book uh, Thomas Friedman had written when he talked about the democratization of opportunity across the world. But while he called the world as being flat, uh, a lot of uh, urbanists, uh, including people like Richard Florida, have said, uh, world is not just flat, but the world is actually spiky, referring to huge concentrations of population in many cities across, across the globe. And perhaps quite rightly, Thomas Friedman quickly concluded that indeed the world is hot, flat, and crowded. This concept of crowding of populations is something that deserves uh, examination. At the turn of the 20th century, uh, one out of six uh, individuals in the planet was urban. By the time we're uh, in the middle of this century, four out of every six persons will be urban. And when you look at the actual size of the urban population that has uh, you know, evolved over this time, it's a massive uh, change. And, and you can see the, the, the magnitude of uh, urban population and therefore the challenges it faces for development. As a result, this 1% of land mass that uh, houses the uh, urban areas uh, accounts for over 55% of population by 2030 will account for 85% of GDP and 78% of energy use. And then by 2050, uh, as we've said, uh, four out of every six individual uh, 
individuals on the planet will be urban. So it, it's a very, uh, very dramatic transformation in a fairly short period of time when you think about society and evolution of uh, civilization. Uh, this has been seen in many economies over the years. Uh, during the period of the Industrial Revolution uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, that region went from being something like 15 to 18 percent urban in 1801. And by the uh, close to the end of the century, uh, it was over 70 percent urban. Uh, and this is a remarkably short period of time for such a dramatic shift in po the population distribution. And we're seeing this in India right now, uh, even in uh, a short period of time, India, which we often consider to be, or we call it out as an agrarian economy, a rural economy, the rate at which uh, urbanization is happening in India is, is extremely uh, uh, staggering. Uh, in fact, literally every half decade, we're able to notice perceptible changes in urban patterns. In fact, a state like Tamil Nadu, where I'm speaking to you from, is already more than 50% urban. So we are uh, beginning to see what many other countries have seen, which is this agglomeration of population in, in urban centers. Now, why, is it, why does it matter for us uh, dealing with transportation and mobility to deal with uh, this urban form? Uh, there is a very important uh, you know, symbiotic relationship between urban form and mobility architecture. You know, I've just got here the typical distributions of population in three cities across the globe. And it doesn't take much to recognize immediately that the kind of transportation system that serves London uh, is not quite the transportation system that needs to serve Hong Kong. Uh, as this uh, densification increases, uh, we will find A, that we are having to cater to uh, ever denser populations, but more importantly, that no two cities are the same. They have unique population distribution, climate, uh, terrain, uh, and affordability characteristics. So mobility is very, very much a local issue. Uh, it defies global prescriptions of uh, a single template. Uh, and global form does not just happen by itself. It, it, it is a consequence of policy. Uh, if London is the way it is today, it is because there was a policy uh, towards the end of the Second World War where the administration de uh, was determined to enforce densification in London and they carved out what they called a green belt surrounding London. In other words, it discouraged development in the green belt and forced a densification of uh, activities, commerce uh, and dwellings in London. In contrast, uh, Los Angeles is really one of the most widely dispersed uh, mega cities. In fact, for housing the same uh, approximately 11 million uh, inhabitants, uh, Los Angeles occupies about eight times the landmass of London. And uh, a consequence of this is the kind of travel patterns it triggers. Uh, the picture on the right was given to me courtesy of KPMG, and it represents effectively single journeys over one day in that entire Los Angeles, San Diego area. And one can see the consequences of urban sprawl. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of travel that is required for commuting, for uh, uh, you know, any kind of uh, activity. And uh, it is estimated that uh, this urban sprawl itself uh, is uh, causing uh, about two and a half percent of erosion of GDP just because of the waste that it, uh, uh, it represents to an economy. Fortunately, a lot of the world today is developing this way. This is Mexico City. And it is typical of a large number of cities, and we can add a number of Indian cities as well in this list. Uh, in fact, in 2018, a study by the OECD showed that out of a, a, a survey of 1,100 cities, 60% uh, of space is now occupied by what's called low density sprawl. In other words, uh, this is uh, 
kind of uncontrolled, uh, without planning, uh, you know, evolution of a city as uh, more and pe more people drift into these urban centers. Uh, so when we look at uh, where we are in India, if we take New Delhi as an example, uh, compared to a very compact city like Tokyo, which uh, you know is an ideal format for the kind of transportation solutions that uh, we want to serve that society. Uh, New Delhi is actually uh, somewhere between where Tokyo is and where Los Angeles. And importantly, if you have the architecture of Los Angeles, this is the mobility architecture that most likely will serve that population. And unfortunately, today in Delhi, uh, with the same trends that we see, without densification and urban sprawl, uh, we are heading very much in the direction of where Los Angeles is. And uh, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is the course for not just Delhi, but all of our cities? You can take Bangalore as an example. You can take Chennai as an example. What is the trajectory we want for our city? Uh, recognizing that, uh, unlike what some people believe, Los Angeles is certainly by no, by no means a, an ideal target for us. Los Angeles, amongst the large US cities, uh, has the most area of freeways, has the most lane kilometers of freeways, and yet has the worst traffic congestion and the worst air quality. Uh, that is not a uh, destiny we would want wished upon any of our cities. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to plan and evolve our cities? Uh, understandably, as population density increases, uh, the modal share of transportation very quickly shifts to public and shared modes. Uh, this is almost logical. Uh, you just don't have space for cars. And if you want to have high density packing of uh, populations, uh, we have to find a much more conducive mass transit system that is going to support this kind of a population. And indeed, if we are concerned about the economic productivity of our cities, it, there's no, it's no surprise that Manhattan and London and uh, Singapore and Tokyo are cities with very high GDP per unit area, and they cannot have that architecture be consistent with uh, a car-based mobility architecture as we've seen with, say, San Francisco or Riyadh or other places like this. Now, having un uh, briefly dwell uh, dwelled on the linkage between urban form and architecture, now we look at the mobility architecture and its impact on environment. Of course, all of us are concerned about uh, CO2, global warming, climate change, and uh, it's, it's staggering to see how many parts of the world already will be experiencing well over 400 ppm of, of CO2 concentration. Very interestingly, this is a, a zip code map in the US created by Berkeley Earth and, um, sorry, by NASA and JPL and Caltech. What's interesting is what we're looking at is right in the center is uh, the green area is Manhattan. On the right is Long Island. Uh, to the west is Westchester County and North Yard, Connecticut. And what this basically says is even New York City, which has a very high per capita income, which would normally correlate to much higher carbon emission per capita, actually has a much lower carbon emission compared to the neighbor, neighboring areas. And the very important contributor to this lower CO2 is the contribution from transportation. Uh, very few people in Manhattan can afford to own a car. They don't have the space to own a car. The predominant mode of travel is public transit. And it is very evident that uh, this region puts out a much lower carbon uh, footprint per capita. And as, as I said, the transportation component was the biggest uh, uh, contributor to this lower value. The other part of um, the whole issue of environment and mobility comes from uh, the air quality. Well before we started to don masks uh, in the context of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, scenes like this were common in many cities. Uh, this is a picture from Shanghai. And even before COVID, people were uh, resorting to masks as the only way to keep themselves safe. 
from uh, particulate matter uh, in, the, in the environment. Uh, this has not been a message that's been easy to get across. I've lectured with the Health Effects Institute in the US, where they have been struggling to get this message across the role of uh, particulates in uh, health and preserving uh, you know, a healthy air environment. But I found this map to be very interesting, not because of the data. Lots of uh, maps like this show similar data of concentrations of, in this case, PM 2.5 particulates on, on uh, measured as micrograms per cubic meter. But more importantly, the equivalence it provides, so saying all those areas in pink and magenta uh, have air quality, which is equivalent to smoking about 10 cigarettes a day. Now, if in all of those areas, we are subjecting our young children to the effective uh, lung damage arising from 10 cigarettes a day, uh, it, it's, a, it's a scary uh, situation. And then unfortunately, this is not just a scenario, this is reality in so many parts of the world. Uh, India, by various measures, one can say how bad the situation is in India or how much have we worked to alleviate it. But the reality is many, many Indian cities today uh, suffer from very unhealthy air. Uh, I know the government is trying to do something about it, but the magnitude of the problem is immense. And uh, it's, it's not nice for us from India to see so many Indian cities listed among the top 10 or top 20 most polluted uh, global cities. And just by going to, uh, you know, BS6 emission norms or Euro 6 emission norms, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, this is data taken from uh, the Westminster, uh, Westminster Council uh, in London. Uh, and it's data from 2017, by which time most of the cars on the streets of uh, London were mostly already Euro 6. And even these cars with uh, ostensibly clean emissions uh, with, uh, you know, particular traps and so on, uh, even in this scenario, uh, over 58% of NOx emissions and 55% of particulate emissions, in this case PM10, were attributed to road transport. So even the prospect of, you know, converting our fleet to BS6 emission norms is still not going to solve the problem for us. And of course, uh, you know, every, every city mayor faces this issue. This is a quote from Mayor Sadi Khan, who was the former mayor of London. And, and you can imagine if he says the air in London is lethal, what can we say about uh, the air in so many other cities which have uh, much higher levels of uh, pollutants? So all in all, it is estimated that anywhere between six to 10% of global GDP uh, is sacrificed uh, as a consequence of air quality and pollution, traffic accidents, and traffic congestion. And uh, knowing how hard economies have to fight to increase their GDP by one or 2% to recognize that we are sacrificing anywhere between six to 10% of GDP for these, these uh, factors, uh, is something that uh, deserves a lot of attention. So what's the auto industry doing? I mean, if you talk to anybody in the auto industry today across uh, regions, they would talk about the four main platforms for addressing future mobility. Uh, and these are electrification, uh, better connectivity for cars, uh, an opportunity to offer shared mobility, and the holy grail, which is autonomy, where they hope they can, you know, improve the economics of travel by eliminating the cost of a driver, and by some uh, expectations uh, to make cars actually safer. Uh, these are goals that the auto industry have taken on. Uh, but when we examine the goals, uh, while they are laudable, and I'm a great uh, believer that. Uh, Electrification is a, a good enabler for us to address some of these problems. Uh, they are not the end all for the kind of problems that we face globally. Um, there is a lot of hype today around the world about electrification, but we have to recognize, of course, that you know there is a the bigger picture of where the energy sources are. Uh, this is uh, a graph 
generated by the Oak Ridge National Labs in the US, uh, which uses a typical well to be greenhouse emission ass assessment. These numbers, these analysis differ depending on your assumption of what is your reference vehicle, what is your reference grid, the atmospheric conditions, and all sorts of things. But if we take this as a typical analysis, uh, even if we were to convert uh, people from buying a gasoline car to using an EV in, a, in the US with the current level of US grid defined by its sources of uh, energy and its uh, efficiency, one may save about 35% uh, in terms of CO2 emissions. If the, the grid had lower efficiency, that gain would be uh, commensurately less. And uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is progress, but maybe not adequate. But the, the core issue to me is that no matter whether the car is electric or gasoline, uh, we seem to have converged on a mobility uh, format, which takes an average individual, an adult weighing about 65 kilograms, placing them in a device that weighs 1300 kilograms uh, to serve as the mobility solution. And somehow, uh, by physics, by you know common sense, uh, this makes uh, very little sense. Um, so, uh, Tesla Model S probably hauls about 1100 kilograms of batteries alone. Uh, when you want to drive across town to visit a friend. Um, there is implicit energy consumption uh, in this format, and therefore uh, this, this can't be the entire solution. We recently commissioned, the Government of India, uh, with a committee that I was a part of, commissioned a study, uh, a more contemporary study reflecting Indian conditions, Indian conditions of the grid, Indian assumptions of vehicle efficiencies and uh, powertrain efficiencies and so on. And uh, this study showed that uh, even with a uh, conversion of uh, somebody using a gasoline engine car to an electric car today, uh, the savings would probably be about of the order of about 6%. Now, this study uh, did a forecast of what it what the situation would be, what the improvements could be, if indeed the national policy stayed its course, and that by 2030, we improve the quality of the grid by increasing the quantum of renewables in the grid uh, and reduce the coal content in the grid from 69% to 65%. And then as you can see, the, improve, the, the situation starts to improve. Uh, there is a niti Ayog, uh, paper that anticipates a very aggressive uh, transformation of our uh, energy grid by 2030. By that estimate, we would be down to 54% of coal dependency. And in that case, uh, the gains are truly impressive. But um, with all of this, we have to therefore conclude that um, you know, there is going to be progress if we have electrification, but it still leaves us with significant carbon footprint, no matter uh, how efficient the electric vehicle. But there is a second dimension to this. You know, no matter what the electric vehicle, um, if it's a conventional car, as most people are uh, tending to develop, it still would occupy a space of about 10 square meters, which just by land value in a place like Bangalore or uh, Mumbai would be would cost more than half a million dollars. Um, and if we are going to require this solution in our cities, we will have to start to very significantly increase the amount of land use uh, that would have to be allocated to cars. Uh, we can see on the right, a country like a city like Tokyo, with a very efficient mass transit system, uh, allocates no more than 15% of its land area to roads. On the other end, a city like Dallas, very car dependent, highway dependent, is forced to allocate 40% of its land area to roads and road infrastructure. So this again goes back to you know, what kind of cities do we want and what kind of cities do we want to live in? So while the auto industry is therefore working on these themes to improve vehicles and make them uh, more future ready, 
what we find cities and city administrators talking about are they're, uh, they're using very different language. Uh, there is a lot of talk about transit oriented development. There is talk about the concept of complete streets. Uh, there is talk of congestion pricing and control and uh, you know, making sure that there is uh, limitations in access to streets based on economics. So there is a whole new set of topics being addressed by society. Uh, and these are uh, you know, important aspects to consider as we start to contemplate what the architecture should be. And indeed, if you go across cities, and this is a study that was done by ICLEI, they surveyed about uh, 58 different cities across the globe and uh, asked them to list out their top three priorities. And for the vast majority of the cities surveyed, uh, when you looked at their top three priorities, uh, something to do with mobility, public transit, carbon reduction, electrification, uh, consistently showed up in the top three. Uh, this nothing more than indicating that this is a high priority problem across the globe. So basically, we can conclude that there is some sort of a, a, transformation that we need of our what uh, many would consider a dysfunctional urban mobility architecture today. Um, when we did this work, uh, as I mentioned about, uh, we took about four years, the book was launched in 2017. Um, we recognized that uh, there is no single prescription. And so what we worked towards was a framework that would be as suitable for Los Angeles as it, as it would for London. And we therefore distilled the framework to the main elements of the framework, uh, which we then uh, distilled down to these four themes. Uh, mobility has to be connected. Mobility modes have to be uh, significantly heterogeneous. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity for intelligent system and intelligent vehicle uh, usage. And finally, mobility is uh, required to be personalized. Uh, what I want to use for my mobility may be different from what uh, another person would want to use for mobility. And furthermore, what I choose to do taking my wife out for dinner on a Sunday evening could be very different from what I want to use to commute on a Monday morning. So there is a very personal element to how we want to allow people to configure their choices. And the framework therefore deals with uh, what I would call uh, the, you, you can think of this as the food ingredients in, in making any menu. You can cook lat you can cook an Italian dinner or you could cook a Mexican dinner, but what would be the ingredients? Uh, first ingredient I'd like to address is heterogeneity. Uh, today, uh, we have a huge number of options, not just in terms of modal choices, but also system choices and transportation solutions. What I mean by this is, you know, traditionally it used to be you had a personal car or you had a publicly shared bus. These were the two bookends of uh, what we could choose. But what has evolved in the last 20, 30 years is an explosion in terms of both the modes. Nobody thought a banker could go to work on a, you know, a little scooter um, in London. Uh, but today there are bankers who commute to work on these little electric uh, push scooters. Uh, motor choices have, ex have exploded. Uh, there has been a lot of innovation in various kinds of e-scooters, e-bikes, uh, and, and solutions have evolved. You know, we didn't know about things like an Uber, the opportunity to uh, rent a car when you wanted, uh, the opportunity to ride food in a car. Uh, software and apps that allow aggregation on the basis of journeys, on the basis of van sharing, ride sharing. So when you take this entire landscape together, we have a very large number of uh, choices we can make in putting together this uh, menu. We can we can make the dishes that we want with a very a very vastly increased number of ingredients uh, that form the basis of, and this is what we mean by heterogeneity. We don't, we, don't, we don't necessarily have to be limited to the choices we had 20, 30 years ago. And the interesting thing about this is, as you move from the right side of the axis to the left, you're finding better ways to share the economic asset. And when you move from 
the vertical downwards, you're finding better ways of sharing the space. And, and so you can imagine that, uh, you know, ultimately we want shared economic asset, we want to share the space, and we also want to share the carbon footprint of travel. So we can find a whole number of options that span this range across these, uh, these dimensions. Once you have all of these modes, the next job is to connect them, and you have to connect them efficiently. You know, the best lesson we can learn for this is from the internet. Uh, the internet was designed as an information communication system that would be extremely robust, in fact, capable of withstanding a nuclear strike, uh, and therefore providing a very robust range of alternatives. So those of you who may not be familiar with it, all that the internet does is break up your data into packets and distributes the packets amongst various nodes. And then essentially the, node, the, the packets may travel different routes and they ultimately are reassembled in sequence at the destination. Uh, when you think about this network problem, people talk about uh, the buffering issue, the latency issue. All it means is how quickly does data get out of where it comes into uh, and how quickly it's processed without waiting, queues, buffering, and so on. It's actually very similar to the transportation problem. Um, you know, the picture on the top left is the Frankfurt Airport Center. And I can land uh, from my flight in Frankfurt Airport, and within 15 minutes, I could be on a train, a high-speed train going to Cologne, or a taxi ride going to Wiesbaden. Uh, the ability to get in and get out and connect to different modes uh, is, is, uh, is vital. Uh, today we find uh, bicycle rentals outside metro stations or bus stations. These are all elements of a physical infrastructure that uh, facilitate connection. Uh, the middle picture is a center in Singapore that allows trains, buses, taxis, bikes, all to be interconnected. Equally today, the connections are provided with uh, digital tools. Um, London offers an Oyster card that allows you to hop off a train and hop into a bus. Uh, maybe even get a, a higher card out of your same Oyster card. Uh, contactless payments, uh, smartphones to you know hail and ride, uh, hail a ride. All of these are ways to quickly connect multiple modes. Once you have a huge a multitude of uh, travel modes and connection opportunities, we need smart systems to be able to integrate all of this. Today, of course, we have uh, a huge amount of intelligence packed in our pockets with our smartphones, in our homes with an Alexa or a, a Google uh, Assistant. And we have a huge amount of uh, intelligence packed into our vehicles. Vehicles can communicate to infrastructure, vehicles can communicate to vehicles. They can more or less navigate by themselves. So there's a whole lot of city-based, and, and many, many cities are now in, investing in smart city infrastructure. So all of this is an opportunity for us to use system intelligence to orchestrate the way we travel. And finally, um, as I said, mobility is often comes down to a personal choice. We each have our priorities for how much time we have for the journey, what cost we are willing to afford for the journey, if we have preferences for traveling with a low carbon footprint, if we have companions with us, how much luggage we are carrying. And literally, we have an opportunity today to synthesize a journey, uh, each journey at a time. So much like a Google map will give you a routing, today we have apps that can literally stitch a journey for you, uh, involving modes, buying the tickets, and, and, and whatnot. So this, this ability to personally deliver choice of solutions is an important element because mobility has to serve you know the broadest cross-section of population for, for any society and this is where there is so much innovation today uh, you know when you talk about startups we find all kinds of startups with whether it is autonomous vehicle technology traffic flow management on-demand mobility street level information and you can literally start to synthesize, any city can literally start to synthesize uh, how they would get their smart mobility ecosystem to work, uh, pulling together mobile application providers, public transport entities, payment engines, mobile ticketing, traffic flow man, monitoring, and so on. Now, all of this is fine, provided that the larger macro 
urban plan uh, is keeping pace with what we with, with all of this technology and all of the all of the needs. Practically every large city that we have dealt with in our study has some sort of a macro master development plan uh, for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. The one we're showing here is the London plan that is looking for the spatial development strategy for Greater London. Um, and this then becomes the basis in which society then starts to dictate or influence uh, what is attractive to the society and what needs to be discouraged. So this becomes the basis of what the planning can be. The elements, of course, would be how does the city think of future expanse of the urban area, uh, the urban planning element of that expansion, and what kind of mobility design they would want, what kind of in investments they are willing to make in infrastructure. Uh, people talk about bus rapid transit systems. I know in India, you can't visit a city in India today without being you know, uh, frustrated by a whole lot of construction on the various streets, but that's hopefully uh, investment uh, for the future because at least 23 of the large Indian cities have got massive metro rail projects underway. So practically every road in every city is getting uh, dug up to build in this infrastructure. And very importantly, the policies and regulations that will guide uh, how this mobility may be served. So you find, for example, when we talk about how does the city plan to use its assets, you know, lots of people now talk about this concept of complete streets. You know, going back to Jane Jacobs and her revolutionary work in Manhattan um, in the 50s, a um, lot of societies are coming to the conclusion today that uh, we've been designing our cities for cars, not for people. And this seems like a very uh, absurd uh, awakening. Uh, you might wonder why it took us so long to decide we were sitting, designing cities for cars and not people. But uh, a lot of cities now have awoken to this and they've started to redo their plans. This means more pedestrian zones, more play areas, uh, restriction of cars in many areas. In Barcelona, for example, they've taken three by three blocks together and they've created that as a single entity within which there will only be pedestrian movement. And so essentially they've moved cars away from every city block to saying you will be two blocks away um, and there will be a new architecture for a, even for an existing old city like Barcelona. So this is this comes down to how are you going to allocate space and how would you utilize urban spaces? European cities do very well in this regard. They have uh, very quickly advanced to bike sharing, bike paths, uh, a lot more focus on pedestrian zones in, in uh, large cities, restriction of vehicles in many areas. And when the vehicles are available, they're restricted to 30 kilometers per hour. So there's a lot that we can learn from, you know, what would be attractive urban centers from a lot of the experiments going around the world. Uh, post COVID now, Paris is uh, looking at uh, rethinking its uh, layout. It wants to become a 15 minute city, meaning it will have many satellite cities and hopefully a lot of people will more or less live, work, you know, go to schools, uh, have their recreation and entertainment within those satellites, and there will be a lesser need for people to literally go across town. Um, companies like Toyota are getting into the act. They're talking about a smart city, which will become a mobility uh, you know, test and playground, looking for not cars in this case, but all sorts of shared mobility that will serve that population, employing all of the, the technologies that we've been talking about for smart cities. A lot of investments going to be necessary for this. Uh, it's going to be not necessarily just more uh, roads and flyways. It's going to be how are we going to intersperse our cities with the kind of pedestrian zones, bus rapid transit system. By the way, Dinesh Mohan was a great uh, early influencer in India in uh, getting people to recognize the value of bus rapid transit systems. And indeed, policies that go hand in hand with investment. In the, um, in the uh, Canary Wharf uh, business district in London, uh, parking spaces were very severely curtailed to discourage people to commute uh, from commuting by cars. 
and rather to use the Docklands light rail to make it happen. So a lot of investment coupled with planning is going to be needed. And very importantly, I think a lot of city administrators have uh, failed to realize that they have levers that they have never used or they have not wanted to use. Uh, city planners have an opportunity to influence transport policy, uh, which will very significantly alter the, uh, the transportation network that is used. The very simple congestion fee in London was instrumental in very rapidly transforming the kind of uh, transport choices people made to travel in, inside London. And this comes together with a combination of incentives and uh, you know, penalties. So in, in uh, Tallinn, uh, you know, public transit rides are free, and now they're trying this in uh, in uh, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, where they want to allow people to travel free on public transit and maybe induce them to drop their cars. And conversely, Singapore uses uh, you know, pricing, road pricing, uh, to make sure that uh, they achieve the same same effect. And of course, there's a lot of work that has to be done in coordinating and orchestrating all of this together. An important concept in, in policy has to come from the intersection between economics and uh, psychology. In, in 2017, uh, Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize for his thesis on what may be simply uh, called the nudge theory. And what this really means is that you can influence choices people make by providing an, or, an array of solutions and further either incentivizing or disincentivizing some of those solutions so that you deserve you achieve goals that hopefully are aligned with what society wants. So in other words, uh, all of these policies, regulations together can become the nudge to help us not the mobility architecture to becoming safer, being better at using space, lowering carbon impact, making it affordable uh, for a broader cross-section of the people, uh, and of course, being less polluting. So this is a framework, therefore, that uh, we allow people to uh, flexibly use so that uh, you know, constructing a mobility architecture for Chennai uh, is going to be as analogous to constructing a mobility architecture for Chicago. So they have very different assumptions, very different ingredients, and a very different set of uh, connections and technology. Now, while all this is going on, and we were trying to get people to move towards shared mobility, um, we suddenly had upon us COVID. And COVID suddenly introduced the vocabulary of uh, social distancing. Um, you know, all of a sudden, we had to become wary of our proximity to one another. Um, human contact was itself considered to be risky in certain circumstances. Uh, at the same time, uh, we began to discover the value of uh, digital communications. Uh, this book, The Death of Distance, was a book by a Cambridge professor, Francis Cancross, uh, in 1998 or so. But she talked about you know distance collapsing because of digital communication technologies, where it kind of uh, was there but never leveraged until COVID came along, and then all of a sudden we found video conferencing and, and you know I'm here talking to you from being 2,500 kilometers away. We found ways to communicate. We found ways to connect, um, and uh, this has been a very major revolution. Uh, that has been triggered by COVID. But importantly, as we got people to move towards mass transit where you know, space is shared, the carbon footprint is shared, the economic asset is shared, a very desirable way to move people, uh, this picture presents a very unappetizing uh, environment, particularly in the context of COVID. Now, Initially, it meant a lot of people said, no, I don't want to take the tube, I'm just going to take my own car. And it actually led to behaviors that was retrograde in terms of all the goals that we were talking about. But fortunately, some other solutions started to emerge. Uber started to say, you know, we're not going to only uh, be purveyors of cars, we'll provide e-bikes, we'll provide scooters, 
Toyota said, we can think about micromobility solutions. Uh, Citroen creates a small little city car, which is all electric, that can be leased for 29 euros a month and provides a very low you know, carbon footprint uh, travel mode. So a lot of people started to come down in towards what we think of as micromobility, uh, where you achieve smaller spatial footprint, you achieve smaller carbon footprint, but you still don't have to be packed in with uh, 40 other people in the, in the confines of a bus. The other major change with COVID was, of course, our patterns in consumption and shopping and dining and entertainment. Uh, while we would travel to a supermarket for whatever we wanted to, to buy, today we expect to sit in our living rooms and have things come to us. And as this immediately led to a huge increase in travel demand of trips that were made, um, we again saw here the, the applications of micromobility solutions. Uh, so today, if you take most Asian cities, uh, these services are served by small two-wheelers, um, small vehicles. Uh, but yet, the number of trips have very significantly increased, and therefore the, the demands on traffic and road, road demands have been significantly increased. Uh, and there are lots of new solutions. I mean, a company like Volkswagen wants to go into pedal cycles, uh, e-cycles in this case. Uh, Neuro wants to have autonomous pods deliver gross needs to you. Uh, Amazon is tied up with Mahindra in India for electric three wheelers for first mile, last mile delivery. So in some ways, one outcome from COVID where we didn't want mass transit was, and we wanted, you know, door delivery was the choice of micro mobility solutions trying to achieve some of the goals we were talking about. But in this, now we will address the, the other aspect of uh, my lecture. This uh, relates to safety. As we started to see more people migrate to bicycles, e-bikes, uh, non-motorized transport, uh, and so on, we began to realize that our streets are really not uh, particularly safe for them. Uh, in the U European Union, which I consider to be a region which is relatively advanced in thinking about these issues. Uh, even in the EU, uh, pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcycle riders, or two-wheeler riders, account for 48% of road deaths. It actually gets worse in the US. Um, sadly, in the US, with all of its uh, you know, wanted technologies, uh, traffic safety has not delivered the kind of improvements that many other developed economies have seen. And in this particular case, we'd be talking about non-occupant fatalities. Uh, it, it's rather alarming that uh, since 2010, uh, the rate at which non-occupant uh, non-occupants suffer fatal accidents has more than uh, has increased by more than 50 percent. And uh, when we look at India, uh, here too, We've been making a lot of investments in highway infrastructure and in metro rail construction. Uh, we've been making cars with uh, better safety features, uh, more airbags, more safety uh, electronics. Even our two wheelers are now having linked braking systems and uh, in many cases ABS. But we're not lowering the level of road accident deaths in our uh, cities. And in India too, when you look at the uh, distribution of uh, road, uh, road safety related deaths, uh, more than 60% of these deaths relate to pedestrian, cyclists, and two wheelers. So, if the objective of getting people into mass transit was stymied a little bit by COVID, and we felt that you know, maybe an option is to have personal mobility but achieved through micro solutions or e-bikes and bicycles. Our road systems are not helping the cause because they continue to be extremely uh, unsafe for users of these modes. So there is a lot of work that we have to do. Um, I have no doubt we are speaking at this conference uh, during a week when there has been an awakening of uh, you know focus on road safety. Uh, Mr. Cyrus Mistry, uh, somebody I knew, somebody I had a great deal of respect for, 
a wonderful human being. Unfortunately, he lost his life in a high-speed car crash. Um, but this was Mercedes with six airbags. Um, and it has created a lot of uh, concern about how we would improve uh, safety in cars. There has been a mandate of six airbags in India for even small cars. There is now a mandate emerging for enforcing seatbelt use. And they are laudable uh, calls. They are laudable requirements. But we have still failed to pay attention to the very large number of uh, deaths and injuries that we are causing on our streets, not just in India, but uh, for this for the purpose of this conference, something we have to be worried about in India, and uh, that as we evolve the mobility architecture, uh, we have to make sure that if this heterogeneity of mobility modes is necessary, we have to perforce rethink our roadways and road systems. Uh, I speak very often at uh, various locations, and this was a talk I was giving at a heritage. Uh, in, uh, an organization that works on city heritage. And I found this old picture of Chennai, where I grew up uh, from the 60s. And this is a, a picture I can recall from memory because I know the geography, I've, I've lived here, I've been here. And what struck me when I see this picture from the 1960s is, you know, there is a very nicely demarcated pavement, the sidewalk, protected from traffic by proper railings, it's properly surfaced. There is a very nice dedicated bike lane, bike lane that is separated from the other modes by curb stones. The bulk of the traffic, the vehicles on the streets are public transit vehicles, there are very few cars. And there were very well organized pedestrian crosswalks with uh, traffic lights to protect them to safely cross streets. What unfortunately we see in too many of our cities today are scenes like this. We attempt to build pedestrian crosswalks, but they are built with a design that uh, very few elderly can care, care to use. As a result, we have chaotic uh, opportunities for pedestrians to cross streets. We have unsafe uh, occupancy in buses. We have model separation between two wheelers and four wheelers to be hardly existent. Our footpaths are occupied by parked vehicles and not intend, not used for the purpose they were intended, even after they have been finished. So there's a lot of work we have to do to make sure that we're able to deliver to our citizens the kind of uh, safety they may expect, they should expect from something as basic as mobility. So let me now close with a few remarks. Uh, just, just a summary. Uh, I think. Transformation of urban mobility is rec recognized as an important topic for most global cities. Uh, mobility architectures have a symbiotic relationship to urban form and factors like affordability, accessibility, and climate. So each city is unique in what it needs. What we worked towards was a chip framework, and this is by no means a pitch for this, any similar framework that can provide a conceptual and flexible tool to help societies craft their own desired mobility architecture. Uh, policies and regulations are essential and they have to be used in the, to nudge user behavior towards solutions that are favorable to societies. These systems must remain dynamic and respond to deviations uh, like we saw with uh, COVID. When COVID happened, policies and systems must react to see what happened as a result of uh, a, 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 an altered set of priorities. And finally, globally, micromobility and non motorized solutions are expected to play an important support role to mass transit going forward. They can hardly serve this role if their safety to users is not ensured. So I hope this conference uh, and the series of work that uh, IIT Delhi will continue to do with all of its uh, partners, collaborators, including our uh, overseas collaborator will continue to you know, help contribute to India and to the globe uh, a much safer and a much more sustainable mobility system. Thank you. For giving this wonderful lecture, you covered such a complex topic so with such an ease and covering a large number of issues. Uh, now I would like to call our discussants on the stage. 
Mr. Anil Kumar is currently Senior General Manager in Tata Motors Passenger Vehicle and Head Body and Trim Engineering. Yeah, good evening everybody and uh, good evening Dr. Sumantan. You know, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in such an important uh, uh, seminar. Uh, as personally also, uh, you know, the two reasons that this is important. Our team, our company was the first to set up crash test facility and the crash safety center and we were, you know, the team, part of the team that was probably involved in crash safety for the first time in India. And two, it's great to, you know, uh, connect back to Dr. Sumantran uh, because of the seminar and also in the context, you know, we had worked very closely uh, with Dr. Dinesh Mohan and the team here uh, under the car initiative that was led by Dr. Sumantran. So we had actually talked about doing collaborative research uh, between industry and uh, academy and we had done a lot of good projects. At Coming back to safety, you know, we all agree uh, it's very complex, there's very little data and uh, the sessions uh, post lunch and before this uh, lecture, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about good quality data not being available for research and adequate research not being there. Uh, Dr. Sumantran's talk was nice from two points of view. It recognizes the thing, uh, the complex issues and uh, I was really impressed with the framework. You know, having data, having, doing research and finding solutions is, is a little, uh, should I say, uh, uses lag measures. You know, you need to have the problem before you find a solution for it. Okay, whereas working and it, it is important because, uh, you know, we do need to learn from what's going wrong and need to keep improving. But I think in the context of Indian uh, transportation sector, okay, we almost uh, sort of discuss, you know, we are going incremental and we believe that's probably the reason why in spite of putting in a lot of technology and a lot of infrastructure and a lot of investments, we don't see reduction in deaths or, you know, fatalities and uh, injuries over the last 10 years. It's time that we actually deploy a suitable framework and design the system and where each element has its role to play and then you can sort of use research to optimize individual elements Whereas right now we just put everything together and almost everything seems to be a knee jerk reaction sometimes or everything seems to be incrementally improving. So we just don't seem to have a uh, idea of how the town or a highway uh, is going to serve, what they are going to serve, uh, you know, what is it required to be done and what is the infrastructure or the uh, design of subsystems required to make that system work safe. I mean, every time we put out a new highway, usually we start off with large number of accidents on the highway and over time people probably learn about what's wrong with that or what's, you know, what's the right way to, or uh, learn about what not to do to, uh, uh, you know, get into an accident and over time the accidents go down. We don't seem to actually design the full system and then start using it. So in that context, doctor, I really appreciate, you know, the framework where uh, it recognizes all the complexities and it actually gives us an idea of how to have a globally uh, sort of uh, optimal solution with every subsystem playing its role. Uh, in the India, you know, in India we do have this uh, uh, discussions about what do we mandate or how much should we put in our vehicle technologies versus what do we do on the infrastructure uh, versus what do we do on the education that was being discussed. But we haven't really got together to do all of them together. We in the auto industry are continuously in touch with the government to talk about the vehicle technologies or how we need to upgrade vehicles. I'm sure there are other agencies which are in touch with the government to discuss about, you know, what do we do on the infrastructure side, okay? But I have not, I mean, last 20 years I've been involved in this field and part of the regulation committees and, uh, you know, so many things, but we have not seen many forums or uh, bodies that handle infrastructure, vehicle technologies, user behavior, everything as one system. So in that context, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
this lecture was really uh, comprehensive and you know doctor i really feel it could become a basis for a lot of policy discussions and system design that we all discuss in various forums thanks a lot thank you uh, mr anil kumar so now i'd like to invite pena um, pepper sanya on the stage he is an alumnus of iit delhi 1985 batch when uh, has been associated with ford motor company my tvs bmw oman hero motors leading marketing sales and service teams in ford india thank you dr tiwari uh, good evening to everyone good evening dr sumantran uh, it is uh, both a pleasure as well as you know an honor to be here uh, in on this occasion having been a student of dr dinesh mohan and uh, i would recall that uh, you know when we as ford came into the country way back in 95 96 and uh, choosing models to sort of bring into the country and the thing was is that uh, you know you had two choices either bring the global model here or sort of modify it to the local specifications and the idea was to remain competitive that was the balancing act and i can remember the debate we had especially with regards to seat belts if i mean anyone here at 1995 it wasn't mandated it wasn't needed rear view mirrors were optional you know no no mirrors on the side and the thing was is that our engineers were very clear no safety would come first and seat belts rear front everything had to be fitted rear view mirrors yes we will have both cost went high competitiveness benchmarks no the point was is that and i think this is where we all come to is is that at least for automakers the responsibility that comes with transportation the responsibility that comes into a market and being democratic or being accessible was by far an overriding consideration and i remember the discussions we had several and you know we all know that the business case was really hard took several years we were, but the strategic decision we'll have it all we'll absorb the cost and i remember even in the future dual airbags was also a decision we had taken the complexities were actually more complicated in dumbing down the vehicle than it was to sort of keep it standardized and these are things that sort of you know you come into in decisions that require the higher purpose and i think that's one thing that we enjoyed and one of the things we did initially was get associated with iit delhi and uh, be a big part of the establishment of trips we sort of established the new port chair i'm very pleased to say that dr mohan was our first chair professor and it has been a pleasure to be with him and work with him very closely in uh, you know justifying different cases and making sure that we raise the bar especially when it came to safety so i just thought i'd share that with you and that's a very personal move and unfortunately i think all of us some most of us at least in this country we've had situations in our family where someone or the other through some road accident which we all believe could have been avoided with better you know yeah you, know, you know much better situations but we go, we we owe it all to them to sort of keep the cause going so that's a little bit of why i'm involved so um dr sumantran thank you thank you for that enlightening presentation and for that description of the chips framework you have in your brief very highly precisely structured and packed presentation been able to connect and shake up various key issues at hand to come up with a clear converged and articulate way to establish a framework on how to move forward with transforming urban mobility for sustainability and most importantly safety your clairvoyant call is for societies communities and governments to be more aware of the symbiotic relationship that needs to be proactively managed between urban design and the mobility arch architecture framework of chips as you referred to it the manner of distribution you know a population within urban areas plays an important role in the nature of demand for mobility hong kong is designed to accommodate over 100000 persons per square kilometers as you mentioned in contrast la is around 4000 persons per square kilometer and the modes of design and transport systems is very different cities can no longer be designed for autos and must be designed for people with mobility as a surface adaptable for diverse solutions and geography needs remain democratic accessible and equitable all while being necessary green and sustainable keeping in mind the never going away problem of climate change 
Rather than a simplistic and prescriptive transportation modern solution, the CHIP framework could be considered to develop and evolve a mobility architecture that best suits a city's need. Depending upon local relevant policies that reflect societal and economical priorities for addressing and synthesizing its urban transportation needs, factors which you mentioned would include consideration and deployment of connected technologies and physical infrastructure, uh, the heterogeneity of multiple mo mobility modes that may be employed for innumerable journeys and routes, the intelligence systems deploying innovative sensors that have been more and more you know, available and accessible, controls and vehicular nodes, and most importantly, personalization given the, given the attitudes that are now emerging from more and more of the millennial and Gen Z requiring inclusivity and uh, personal situations. Such a framework, when orchestrated along with a combination of related policies and regulations, could nudge people towards behaviors and suitable choices that would be beneficial to society and provide flexibility to suit a wide spectrum of cities and economies. Essentially, by inducing commuters to consider such nodes of mobility solutions, we could discourage them from others that are deemed to be adversely impact, which adversely impact society. Congestion fees you mentioned, fee travel, free travel on public transit, limited parking spaces, subsidized last mile shuttles are such examples of policies that nudge user behavior. These could be government or these could also be done by private parties. While Dr. Samantan addressed quite a few uh, you know, suggestions and um, you know, our approaches, uh, would request to consider uh, you know, uh, uh, some, some other aspects that need to be addressed simultaneously and concurrently as this uh, CHIPS framework evolves. One, the factory movement of goods and freight as at these burgeoning urban centers, as the infrastructure and mobility modes must be shared in tandem and will necessarily have to have their own logistic needs and modes and need solutions. Uh, the avoidance and curtail curtailment of urban sprawls by developing high density cores or corridors supporting the viability and load factors of multiple transport modes. As you can see why New York has subways and uh, you know, the, the whole load factor and why Delhi, it's uh, you know, our own uh, metro, uh, I mean, the fact that you don't have multi-story uh, you know, housing and you just have a floor factor which is maybe two or three floors will never give the kind of density required to make these sort of investments viable. And we are not going to be able to see such solutions uh, be supported, uh, you know, uh, because we'll never have uh, the necessary finance for the development that is occurring. We need to develop economic models, preferably a private public financing for ensuring that the smart infrastructure that is being proposed is clearly, uh, you know, established as it's evident that there's inadequate public capital to stay ahead of all these developments. Partnerships with existing auto companies and other industries with the ever-changing mobility landscape should allow access to capital resources and management to execute. But most importantly, it'll help to articulate the situation and work towards explaining to everyone what it is that we do to gain more and more societal consensus. Uh, thank you, these are just a few of the thoughts that came to me and I thought that once again, uh, your, your book and title of, uh, you know, of yours, your suggestions uh, for a faster, smarter, and greener, I would just add safer to that title too. Thank you, Dr. Sumantra. Thank you. In the afternoon session, we heard motorized two-wheelers as a major factor in the death and injuries that are happening on the roads. They are the ones who are suffering. And there's an epidemic of motorized two-wheelers in towns and cities of India. And the policies seem to encourage that only. When you argue public transport can change that, no one is thinking of the cost per kilometer in a motorized two-wheeler today is far cheaper than a public transport expenditure, be it metro or some of the bus. So unless some thinking is done on that, so you showed public transport, but no one is going to move from a motorized two-wheeler to a public transport unless there's a huge subsidy. The 
paradigm shift in the sub move from subsidizing metros to public transport that are much cheaper than the metros so do you have a suggestion on well we had an opportunity to see this firsthand you know when i was the ceo of tata motors um we employed i don't remember now 14000 15000 people in our pune the factory and um, we offered buses we had, would have our company buses you know uh, a fleet of buses that would go pick up uh, their employees and bring them into work but with the advent of the popularity of two wheelers that uh, you correctly referred to we found an explosion of uh, our workers coming into work on two wheelers for the simple reason that they had better flexibility about time they had better flexibility of the route they could probably run an errand on the way and so on so i think we have to keep in mind that there is a utility offered by the two wheelers and yet and yet we've got to find a way to make this as a system work my only uh, the offer of a solution in this would be as follows um much like you know the the blood transport problem in the human body is analogous we have main arteries and veins that carry a very large flow rate of blood per second per second per minute whatever and then you have finer arteries and finer veins as we go into our wrists and our limbs and so on i think the heterogeneity of human uh, of mobility modes need to be leveraged so what do i mean by this um why should you not be able to take a simple share auto for the first or two kilometers uh use that to get into either a bus or a metro uh and if these connections were to be a flexible adaptable to your needs available on demand not like uh, you know waiting for the bus and if you miss it you get the next bus 30 minutes later how do we make this system work uh where therefore there is constant economic viability of each of these modes we see this in some of our cities evolving by itself I mean, look at the six V, six seater E rickshaws in Delhi. You know they're very efficient in moving people from one uh, work spot to a local metro. Now, if we can daisy chain the right selection of modes, frankly, we are soon going to reach the point where a young couple, the wife, might likely tell the husband, "I don't want you to go to work on a two wheeler. It's too dangerous. Why don't you just take public transport?" And if these solutions were to be daisy chained. and you leverage this combination of heterogeneity connectivity intelligence uh you could potentially come up with an architecture that attempts to solve this problem because um yeah the, the, the sheer specter of danger uh, with the streets that we have today should itself be a disincentive yeah uh, dr anil here you know just to add one more point point is while there are different types of people with different needs even every one of us has different transportation needs at different times of the week okay so i don't think we'll have one solution to say uh, uh, no to two wheeler or some other transport mode but if you can say make the person travel 95% of the time in a public transport system say especially when he's going to work and come back where the schedules are reasonably fixed and so on okay we have reduced the risk significantly we are not saying should because two wheelers you know fatalities are, are higher we should not use two wheeler there are times when two wheelers will have their advantages and this thing but if you can make sure people are using safer modes or more efficient modes of transport for larger part of their transportation needs without compromising on their own uh, sort of economic growth or work life balance in a way okay uh, you know it could solve a big problem you have another question yeah uh, my question is to uh, is addressed to dr sumantran uh, Good evening, sir. My name is Ruchi. I've worked with Professor Mohan for about 17 years. I was a young architect who joined, and now I'm an urban designer and social entrepreneur with my venture called Human Kind. And we create community-centered safe school zones with children. Uh, why I was putting this precursor because I know uh, that Professor Mohan really valued human life. and uh, there's a quote of his which says smart cities should only have heart soul and compassion and uh, just looking at your uh, framework uh, i was just wanting to know your thoughts of 
like how do we bring more value centered and people uh, focused approach in mobility as a service because in this whole experience of smart cities people get gobbled up only in the form of engagement uh, so how do we make transportation system seamless uh, but also give seamless dignity to the end user um, I work with children and children constantly complain how they are invisible and uh, they see everything hostile around them and that's why they don't care by the time they are adults. So we are trying to attempt to break that cycle through a mobility architecture for school zones. But I would definitely like to know your thoughts. Thank you. So I think there are two elements to your uh, question. Uh, let me take the second one first. How do we uh, get children not to be invisible? You know, very simple thing. How, how many playgrounds, play areas, parks, recreational areas do our cities offer? You know, we don't give the children a chance to come out and be children and because streets are unsafe, pavements are non-existent. Uh, we don't have quiet spaces, not just for uh, children, also for the elderly. So I think there is a lot that can be done in urban design to make cities a lot more appealing to uh, the children and as well as the elderly. The second part of your question has to do with human dignity. You know, nothing prevents us today from enforcing. I mean, Uber, as it works in the U.S., is considered exploitative. But Uber, as it's required to work in many European cities, is forced to acknowledge a number of realities, that they are not just some technology platform, but they are an employer. With the, empl the role of an employer, they have obligations. There is something called a minimum wage, that there are health benefits that are, uh, that are to accrue to every user. So uh, there, are, there is no reason why policies cannot be made to ensure that every human being is allowed to work with a minimum of dignity and a minimum of respect of his or her rights. So I think we must find a way to make sure that this energy and entrepreneurship that is unleashed with startups and innovation does not necessarily head down uh, a path that is uh, adverse. And if there is anything I have learned in this last uh, few years of research, it is that most policy makers fail to use a whole number of levers that they have in their hands, but they don't seem to know that they have in their hands. That we're going through some amazing contortions to not tamper with the present political system, which has uh, made its own choices, has decided that we have to work around it, and therefore transport will have to follow. But the, the funny thing is that you don't have to change the political system all that much under the constraints of no, uh, a shortage of uh, heating gas and uh, fuel for, because of the sanctions they've put on Russia. Uh, Germany has had, without any other change um, in its political architecture, to decide that they can perhaps make the entire uh, public transport free. Now, that, that was interesting to me because I would like to say that one should go further because the future is about making choices of this kind and that perhaps, you know, when you go so far to try to work your way around all the barriers that are put up by a very, very predatory system we are in at the moment, um, sometimes you defeat yourself and you step on yourself a lot of Uh, is something to think about because it's possible that we could make certain choices and one day we will probably be forced into making them and that we could perhaps prepare for it mentally. No, I mean, uh, I mean there are numerous examples through history. Uh, the way Jane Jacobs uh, was able to deflect the trajectory of uh, roadway construction and highway construction in Manhattan, uh, the whole concept of neighborhoods. Even in India, we've seen a number of cases that uh, when we pull on some levers, 
uh, we sometimes surprise ourselves that it's not been so difficult, that it's not been so hard. So I would agree with your point. Uh, there, there's many things that we can do, and this is why I keep saying policymakers sometimes don't realize that they have a lot more levers that they can use, but they don't know that they have it in their power to use. Thank you, Professor. A very enlightening uh, session we had and the discussions that have followed. Uh, so I work in the space of uh, freight, and my question to you is, uh, given the context of you know smart cities and how we like to have very connected cities, and uh, given the context that we've had COVID the last few years, we've seen an increasing number of two-wheeler presence in the freight space, and especially more so because we would want to have everything delivered at the comfort of our homes. How does one really get into this, uh, you know, a sort of a balance where you're trying to have smart cities where you are well connected, you have everything at the call of a, you can call and deliver in, but at the same time, you're trying to uh, ensure that there's just the right number of vehicles or the right number, or how do you d basically get to this balance? Um, well, again, I come back to this whole business of policies and knowledge. Uh, you're right that uh, as there has been disaggregation, there has been requirement to move freight uh, at the more granular level. We have increased the number of trips because, for example, and, and I have to make this confession, I ordered a snap-on cover, protective cover for my, sna for my smartphone, and it was delivered to me by a guy who rode on a motorcycle. This is a piece of uh, you know, plastic that cost 40 rupees. Somebody rode on a motorcycle, came delivered to me. It was the wrong part. He came, picked it up again, went back, and then he brought the correct part. Three trips for a 45 rupee plastic part. So yes, we have made, uh, a, a, we've created a problem for ourselves. But again, I don't see why this cannot be solved because for example, controlling traffic and the number of uh, city uh, vehicles on streets, the first example would be say London or Singapore. They just put a congestion fee. If you're gonna come into the city, you're gonna pay so much. And it's a very expensive fee to be able to drive your car. In. So, okay, you say, oh, that, that's first level. Then what happens is a car that once it's in there, it says, I can drive around for 24 hours. You know, I can be around, I can do as many kilometers as I want for 24 hours. Then you bring in the next layer and say, I'm going to be road tolling and I'm going to tax you per kilometer of uh, vehicle space. Now, when you start to keep doing things, you have an ability to, you know, sculpt with a scalpel and not with an ax. So you can fine tune the policies that you want to make. And what did this result in? You know, we discussed this with the discussant. In London, 35% of vehicles occupying streets are delivery vehicles. So when you start to put in financial penalty on their presence in, uh, on streets, two very large uh, retailers, uh, Frito-Lays and Mars Foods, both, you know, very strong competitors, very bitter rivals. But they found that they had to come together to say, let us share a delivery vehicle to restock some of the city streets uh, stores. The message was, even amongst you know sworn rivals, you can force cooperation with financial policies. So Frito-Lay and Mars actually share a delivery van because if they have to stock some of the city street stores uh, every two hours, they've got vehicles to go there quite often and, and they can't afford it with the older system. So there are a very large number of tools, mechanisms that we have in place or we can have in place to mold it. But the most important issue is the dynamics. Typically, policy making, regulatory policy or regulations, framing regulations in a democracy takes a long time. Technology moves much faster. Consumer behavior moves much faster. So we've got to find ways, and again, Singapore is an example. That's one place where I would say the administration's a clock speed for being reactive to changes in consumer behavior or technology is much more rapid, and therefore they're able to keep closer in pace with what's going on. In many democracies, we suffer from a very prolonged period of you know, policy making and regulations. Thank you. I think that's a nice closing <laughs> remark. And uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, Dr. Sumantran for giving this very enlightening, engaging talk. I'm sure all our young researchers have several um, nuggets to take back with them and several uh, food for thought and think about 
uh, for this important topic. I'd also like to thank uh, both Mr. Anil Kumar, who's come from Mumbai today just for this discussion, and also Vin Vinay Paper Sanya to be with us today and uh, getting this you know, reflection on Dr. Samantran's thought and being with us. And uh, also, I think the last remark from Dr. Samantran, yes, democracies are slow, but we have to have faith in democracy, and especially for young people. As Professor Mohan always said, I'm not going to live very long. It's for you people to solve the problem. I think I'm also at that stage now. I can say that. So all for the young researchers, we have to have faith in democracy. If it's not working, we have to make it work. And, that, and that's how we move ahead with our technical and especially socio-technical solutions. So thank you so much. And as a token One last of comment, one last comment. Professor Mohan also said, democratic processes are always slow, but they are longer lasting. 